thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Preliminary Society of Massachusetts' February meeting. I am Bob Allison, President of the Preliminary Society. And we are here essentially as to offer your oyster, who was for 32 years the editor of publications of the Preliminary Society, as well as a driving force in Boston's historical circle. Is actually responsible for the fact that the Colonial Society has this beautiful building as its home. So we are deeply <laughs> indebted to him, and to honor Walter Muir Lightfield, the Colonial Society created the Walter Muir Lightfield Prize, which is given to the best article published in the New England Quarterly, which is another uh, and a venerable journal, a venerable but lively journal of natural and American history, uh, which is now headquartered at UMass Boston. And right now, the Lego Prize, for those of you who are interested, the next year's Lego Prize has missed the deadline. Submissions are due in early January. And the panel of Colonial Society members, Fred Anderson, David Hall, and Nate F. Norton, vet the winning, vet the nominees. And this year, it was a quite an easy choice. And we have the author with us this afternoon. Familiar with is probably someone known to most of us. She received her undergraduate degree in history and government from the Kendall Adams from Harvard, and then she went to Princeton, where she earned her PhD. And for the past 25 years, she has been on faculty at the University of Connecticut. We could cut this and do some of you get a week long. Mm, that's yeah. pretty much right. <laughs> Previous to your time, she was at the University of California, Irvine, for about eight years and also spent a year or two at the College of William and Mary. And among her publications was um, a raft of, of articles addressing extraordinarily interesting topics that she holds. Uh, I don't know how she finds the time to spend in the different archives she wants to find the great stories that are underlying her books. Her first book was Women Before the Bar, Gender, Law, and Society in Connecticut from the mid-1600s to just after the American Revolution. And she also is one of the contributing editors to Women's America in the focus of the attack. The other editors are Linda Ferber and Jane DeHart and Judy C. Sun Wu. Now in its eighth edition, I believe. Ninth, ninth. Ninth edition, <coughs> collection. And Robert Love Warner, Searching for Strangers in Colonial America, which she wrote with Sharon Salinger which is a terrific book on Robert Love and the warning out of people in revolutionary Boston. And Robert Love's warning precedes awards from both the Organization of American Historians as well as the American Historical Association. And she's still working on this great book, Frames of Distraction, Selfies and Fantasies from Freeing Society on Latin America. But to hear her talk to us today about another of her work as I try to think about your work, it really is this intersection of hmm. the personal and the legal. You know, hmm. she is, in some ways, could be a legal historian, but you're finding the stories of people who, one way or another, come before the law. And I think that's what led her to her current, what she'll be talking to us about today. And I'm not going to give too much away. <laughs> the White Hill Prize winning essay, Cat <coughs> Lost Years Recovered, on John Peters and Phyllis Wheatley Peters in real time. So please welcome <laughs> Judy Hayes. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and to the council for inviting me um, to speak uh, at, with members at a stated meeting. Thank you, everyone, for being present on screen and here in, in at 87 Mount Vernon Street. Um, I'm really eager to hear your thoughts and your questions about this project, so I hope I can keep this fairly concise um, and hear from you. But the first question that always comes up always is, how did I come across documents that shed light on a missing set of years in Phyllis Wheatley Peters' married life? I am not a scholar of early American literature and poetry, uh, let alone a specialist on Wheatley. <coughs> a friend has put this well, Dan Ernst, uh, who teaches at Georgetown and writes for the Legal History blog. He put it well, I think. He said, sometimes when you're a legal historian, 
just doing your job, you turn up something unexpected and wonderful, he said. Dayton, he wrote, was minding her business, reading the records of every contested will case in colonial Massachusetts when she came across a case with an uh, appellant named John Peters. So he captures the origin story of this well. I was in the reading room of the Massachusetts State Archives reading a fat folio volume um, containing the minutes of the Supreme Court of probate. Um, that actually was the governor and counselor council who several times a year sat as the appellate probate court hearing rulings um, that had been appealed from probate judges across Massachusetts. And at this moment of discovery, I was um, in the midst of identifying the 30 or so contests that over wills that involved what lawyers call testamentary capacity. These cases in which neighbors gave conflicting testimony over whether a testator was of sound mind uh, <coughs> when he or she wrote the will provide very valuable evidence for another project I've been working on for a long time um, on how New Englanders coped with mental and cognitive health challenges. But John Peter's name caused my heart to skip a beat. The appellant was not described as black um, <coughs> in this uh, 1779 record book. Uh, at the, in the colonial period, African and African descended litigants had been um, labeled, um, but not um, anymore in 1779. Uh, but from teaching about Wheatley in my history courses, I was familiar with the general outlines of her life, and I knew the name of the three black men she married. And I also knew that his backstory was unknown. So perhaps I thought this case could lead us to learn new things about Peters. So in this December 1779 probate appeal, uh, the appellant Peters was described as traitor, of Boston. His co-appellant was Dinah Cubber of Middleton, <coughs> and the two were legatees named in the will of Lieutenant John Wilkins, who lived in the Essex County town of Middleton. <coughs> Peters and his um, ally were appealing the probate judge's decree of a few months earlier that declared um, Wilkins's will invalid. And who was the appellant's lawyer? For those of you who know the bar in 18th century Massachusetts, none other than a young Perez Morton, then 28, who would later become both infamous and famous in the Commonwealth. So what I saw that day in the archives uh, led me on a prolonged paper chase, culminating in the discovery of several legal cases, probate cases, civil cases, criminal cases, that spanning four years and encompassing a total of about 120 documents. For me, the issue of mental inc incapacity in this particular case melted away. It had been inaccurately advanced by a disgruntled heir. So what made the chase worthwhile was that these legal papers revealed uh, a lot, not only about John Peters, such as where and in what circumstances he grew up, but also about what transpired in the Peters' married life in the years 1780 to 1783, a period that biographers of the poet uh, have called the lost or missing years, in which we didn't know where they went, what happened to them. Thus, these papers, which I call for convenience the Middleton dossier, join many recent and ongoing studies that shed light on the diversity of black lives in New England and in the Atlantic world. And of course, one reason these new findings um, are exciting is because Phyllis Wheatley is a significant intellectual figure. Uh, she is known as the foremother of American, African American literature. She was the first person of African descent to publish a book of poetry in English in 1773, and this was particularly <coughs> remarked on at the time because when her book of poems was published in London, she was enslaved and she was a teenager. When she returned, returned from London, where she'd gone to oversee her book's publication, 
her supporters who had hosted her in England um, and others in the English press who reviewed her book favorably pressured her enslavers here in Boston, John and Susanna Wheatley, to free her. One of the many unanswered questions about um, the poet is what happened to the manumission deed. Soon after it was executed, Wheatley wrote to a correspondent that the instrument is drawn so as to secure me and my property and secure whatsoever should be given me as my own. She added that a copy had been sent to Israel Modit, or Modi Esquire in London, someone she had gotten to know there, uh, as a kind of insurance policy. But yet, as of today, neither the original manumission document nor the 18th century copy have surfaced. Well, what else do we know about Phyllis Wheatley as she reached adulthood? Certainly we know that she became a devout Congregationalist, choosing to be baptized at age 16 or so in Old South, uh, which was not the Wheatley's church, so she's making her own choice in that. The baptism was performed by the minister of yet another Congregational church, the Reverend Samuel Cooper, to whom she remained devoted <coughs> until his death. And we know that her faith gave her comfort as she expressed in her letters to Obor Tanner of Newport. But beyond this, there's a great deal, quite a lot, that we don't know. <coughs> um, after the, the successive deaths of Susanna and John Wheatley by late 1774, we know little of how she was faring in Boston. Indeed, MHS librarian Peter Drummy insists that there are 10 missing years uh, for which we don't know much about Wheatley's life from 1774 to 1784 when she died. So the Middleton dossier has changed that, but only to some degree. As a researcher and a writer, having stumbled on this probate appeal, I felt that I faced a daunting task to translate the many scraps of paper into a coherent interpretive narrative. The overlapping lit litigation that I found um, set up very complicated timelines. The cast of characters was vast. <coughs> uh, and so it took me several years and the help of allies who were researchers too to track down the pertinent litigation, to identify all the players in the Middleton tax and town records, um, and to glimpse aspects of the relationship between John Peters and it turns out he had three brothers who lived for a long time <coughs> in Middleton. So another reason that these new findings are important is that they should finally and definitively push aside the negative depiction <coughs> of John Peters that was put forward by Margareta O'Dell in, in her 1834 published memoir of Wheatley. O'Dell was a collateral descendant of Susanna Wheatley and her account rested on what Wheatley family members had told themselves about the poet's life and death, namely that they had been the best caretakers of, as she put it, meek and unassuming Phyllis Wheatley. Let me give you a sense of Adele's writing. This is an excerpt from her description of the courtship. In an evil hour, he, John Peters, was accepted, and he proved utterly unworthy of the distinguished woman who honored him by her alliance. He was unsuccessful in business and failed soon after their marriage. And he is said to have been both too proud and too indolent to apply himself to any occupation below his fancied dignity. Hence, his unfortunate wife suffered much from this ill-omened union. Well, we have arrived, I hope, in 2022 at a point where there is documented evidence to refute or cast doubt on everything that Odell wrote. In the past decade, eminent scholars such as Henry Louis Gates Jr. and Wheatley's modern biographer, Professor Vincent Coretta, have pushed back against Odell's unsubstantiated and racist depictions. Scholar and poet Honoré Fanon Jeffers delivers the most eloquent um, and effective plea for our taking seriously the Peters marriage 
um, for contemplating that they were a loving and mutually supportive pair uh, and for underscoring that for the last five years of her life, the poet chose to be known as Phyllis Peters, not Phyllis Wheatley. So I highly recommend Jeffers' 20-page essay that is at the end of her book. The essay is called Looking for Miss Phyllis, and it concludes her 2020 book of poems, The Age of Phyllis. So the Middleton dossier and other documentation of Peter's adult life uh, move us farther along the path forged by Jeffers, Gates, and Coretta. Um, I'm just going to give you right now my current five-sentence profile of Peter's distilling what we know. Surely this will go through many updates in coming years as more is discovered, unco uncovered. But you might want to sort of compare this with what I read from Odell. So I would, I would say John Peters transited, as we'll discover in a minute, from enslavement as a, as a young person to free status sometime in the 1770s, powered by his ingenuity and verve. For years to come, he was a frequent litigator, self-taught in courtroom conventions. He developed an impressive skill set uh, and pursued many vocations, shopkeeper, itinerant trader, yeoman farmer, pencil smith, lawyer, physician, often simultaneously. He died in 1801 in Charleston, um, owning a sorrel horse, a suki and slaves, a silver watch, uh, 14 books, two mahogany tables, and a silver mounted clothes horse, among other objects and land. That he insisted on being treated with the dignity and recognition he believed he was due and that he aspired from an early age to genteel status helps explain both why some wary white observers painted him as an unduly assertive black man and why Phyllis Wheatley found him an appealing kindred spirit. So what is it that we learn in the Middleton dossier? I'll just give you some highlights. First, uh, most obviously, the location. We learn the location where John and Phyllis Peters went when they left Boston for those three years, 1780 to 1783. That information had eluded biographers. We now know it was Middleton, an interior Essex County town that had been carved out of the western part of Salem Village, or Danvers. It was the third poorest town in the county um, if you go by the provincial taxes generated annually in this period. Second, we glean some information about John Peters prior to his marriage. He was enslaved on the Wilkins farm in Middleton uh, as a youth and sold by the Wilkinses in adolescence, and we do not know to whom or, or where. Uh, I speculate in the article it might have been New York, where it's often a place where New Englanders <coughs> trafficked uh, enslaved people, um, but I also think there's a strong Salem connection, so it's possible it was Salem. Three of his brothers, we learn, grew up in enslaved households in Middleton, um, became free, and remained in the area. What's curious, perhaps, is that they used a different surname. They used the surname Francis, and according to one brother, um, the man we know as John Peters initially used the name Peter Francis. He was baptized Peter without a surname. And then in the early 1770s, he, he experimented with other names. He styled himself, for instance, Peter Freiser, which is presumably a German surname. It doesn't have, an, you know, you can't find it in New England. And then he settled on John Peter. According to his brother, he obtained his freedom, we don't know how, around 1776 and was living in Boston. So third, starting at that time, 76, Peters reestablished relations with the now aging Wilkinsons of Middleton, who had, by it turns out, no sons, no sons-in-law, and he convinced them that he was the most reliable person to help them manage their estate in their old age. And uh, he would make frequent trips from Boston, 20 miles. Uh, the women of the Wilkins household washed his linens and white shirts for him, kept his horses, 
while he, still based in Boston, purchased provisions and spirits, Jamaican rum, etc., cetera, uh, for them and undertook various errands. After Lieutenant Wilkins died, the widow, Naomi, uh, gave Peters a power of attorney to manage the farm and pay creditors. After some months of Peters handling all of that from a distance, the widow invited John Peters to move his family, as she put it, into her homestead, which, uh, talking to people like Martha and others, we assume was a kind of two-story, lean-to, clabbered house, as others in the area were. <coughs> What's really interesting here is that Peters agreed to do so only after negotiation. Uh, and that resulted in, first, the form his former enslaver, Naomi Wilkins, Wilkins deeded to him 110 acres, the, the central farmstead, homestead. And in exchange, he signed an unusual document, a conditional deed um, reconveying the farm to her if he did not fulfill a promise to support her uh, in the manner she was uh, entitled to for the rest of her life. Uh, so the quote is, he promised to provide her with everything necessary to a comfortable support and maintenance, both in diet and apparel, including, uh, when she was in poor health, physicians, medicines, and delicacies. So I would say this bargain was highly unusual. I would love to hear uh, people know others like it in New England. For, of a black or indigenous adult, bargaining for and receiving sizable acreage from a former enslaver. And legal historians tell me that a conditional deed of this sort, which um, Peters called a mortgage deed, uh, is also very rare for the 1700s. And they wonder if the lawyers involved, Theophilus Parsons and William Wetmore, um, had ever drawn up one like this previously. John and Phyllis Peters must have started their residence in Middleton hopeful that John's yeoman status um, and ownership of a farm he had worked on as a youth would secure their livelihood and afford a healthy environment for them to raise a family. Uh, they're in their 20s. And for Phyllis to live an intellectual's life as a poet and a writer. Phyllis had a serious asthmatic condition, and in that period, people understood country air versus Boston air to be helpful. But after a few months, the relationship between Widow Wilkins and Yeoman Peters ruptured, um, causing the widow and her companion, Dinah Cubber, a free black woman, to move out to a nearby rented house. And from then on, the widow refused to allow Peters to fulfill his pledge to support her. Town officials like selectmen and white allies of the widow obstructed his management of the land. I mean, here he was in charge of 110 acres, um, uh, raising crops like, well, hay, uh, apples, corn, etc. But they literally hired people, including one of his brothers, um, to remove the crops from the land. And he wasn't able to stop them. He sued them for trespass. Around this time, Peters launched an unsuccessful second probate appeal, this time asking to be appointed a state administrator of Lieutenant Wilkinson's estate, which would allow him to legally control the livestock, the farming utensils, and all the other movables. Uh, he was in a rare legal bind living in Middleton in that he was the owner of the land, but technically he did not control any of the other property uh, <coughs> because he was not the administrator of the state. And he made this argument to the judge. It's only, the, it's most efficient. It's most, uh, it only makes sense if you make me the estate administrator. But what happened was a striking petition campaign by a majority of the household heads in Middleton who came to John Estes Tavern on November 22nd in 1780 and signed a petition um, not only trying to block and prevent um, the fulfillment of Peters' plea, but accusing him of embezzling uh, aspects of the estate. And I have to say the 
the Middleton Congregational Minister, Elias Smith, was the first signer of this petition. So during this fraught time, there were suits and countersuits initiated um, between Peters and the widow and her allies involving trespass and debt. But most importantly, widow, widows, widow Wilkins won an ejectment suit by which John and Phyllis were forced to leave the farmstead in September 1783. They returned to Boston, where Peters' debts from this Essex County episode led to sporadic stints in debtor's prison, including at the end of 1784 when his wife died at the age of 31 or so. There's one last thing that I'll tell you that we learn from the dossier, and that is that prior to their ejectment, in the, in the midst of the turmoil, we, we, kn we know, we are told that Phyllis and John Peters had a living child. And this is very significant because it's the first documentation we've found um, of um, their childbearing and, and having children. In July 1782, John brought a criminal complaint that Dinah Cover, the free black woman I've mentioned already, had assaulted his infant child and attempted to destroy the life of said child. So it's a parent's worst nightmare. We don't know anything more about this because um, John did not pursue the charges. He brought the charges, she was arrested and um, bailed, uh, but because he did not show up in, in the next uh, court hearing, there was no trial. So we literally have a 28-word um, legal document um, using the words that I just um, gave you. So in sum, the middle ten years of Phyllis and John Peters tell a heavy and a harrowing and a complex story. Uh, I consider my article to be an opening, an invitation to renewed inquiry into both of the Peters' lives and is especially, I think, the experiences of other black landowners who experienced resistance and harassment from white neighbors, it, especially in the 1780s and 90s, a period when slavery was ending in Massachusetts. Um, and I think this really bears looking into uh, and I'll just end by saying that uh, to accompany the article, I am working with a team at my university in de designing a website which will contain transcripts and facsimiles um, of about 20 of the core documents um, in what I've just described, the Middleton years. Um, it will have some commentary, some contextualization, <coughs> a timeline, a family tree of the Francis brothers. Uh, it is nearing completion, and we should be ready to launch it later this spring. So the, I'd really love to hear your questions, et cetera, and I would just say that you know, we, one thing we might talk about is why these, these documents are all on the public record. So one question might be, why, why did they go unheeded for so many years? when they could tell us quite a lot about the celebrated Phyllis Wheatley. Thank you all. <laughs> Dot. What sort of interaction did the Peters have with the African community in Boston <coughs> uh, or, or elsewhere for that matter, but if they were living in Boston, mm -hmm. one would think that they mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We could assume, but we, we have nothing concrete to go by, right? And that's why I was saying at lunch that I'm really waiting for Cherno Sese's book to come out on Prince Hall and his, um, his uh, network because I'd, I'd really like to know um, to what extent, and, and especially John Peters, right? Because he lives on another 15, 16 years yeah. in 1780s and 90s Boston, um, and he's a very enterprising person. Um, and um, uh, but we can for now we can only speculate. Um, I, I mean, but we can also ask that question about Middleton. Um, you know, I've been able to use the vital records of church records to document 
other African descended people who lived in Middleton. It's a small cluster. Um, but I think we still need to think through and what were his relationships with his brothers um, who are interesting in their own right. Um, and we get a sense from <coughs> the litigation I've described of, uh, I don't quite know how to put it, but it's hard to read his, his the nature of his relationship with the one brother who gives direct testimony, Snow Francis, who I think was, um, was really dependent on his life on the patronage of wealthier white people in Middleton um <coughs> and um, didn't have the worldliness and the refinement that certainly Phyllis Peters, Phyllis Wheatley Peters had. So one senses that often Snow Francis had to basically side with the powerful whites who employed him against his brother you know, in this trespass case, and, and, and so he was kind of, Snow Francis was caught in between. So I think it's an excellent question. What are the black communities like, both in a rural town like Middleton, and I'm assuming he had ties across Essex County because he was always traveling to Newburyport, Ipswich, and Salem, mostly on legal, but also economic matters. So I would love to know more about that, Don. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, let's see if I can narrate this responsibly. Um, <laughs> it all happened on a particular day, according to the witnesses, August 16th. Um, and the problem that we have to bear in mind with this testimony is that it all came from people hostile to Peters. So we don't have his voice because he was the appellant in the case that produced the testimony, so he couldn't be, and his wife couldn't testify, right? So we don't, we only have hostile witnesses, basically. Um, <coughs> and by those accounts, there's sort of three of them that jibe. Um, he was, it's very vivid, it's almost like a cinematic scene. He was out at the barn mm, talking with a local prominent white person who had dropped by, whether they were having a business reckoning, probably. Um, and that person said that uh, he, that Peters went into a rage, stormed into the house, and began threatening Dinah Cover. Um, and that's what Dinah Cover said, and that's what Lyra Wilkins said. Um, and Dinah ran for her life, that's her story. And the widow was visiting at a neighbor's house, and she went there, and they never came back. Um, but my reasoning is, you don't go, you don't, you don't get into a rage like that unless something triggers it. And none of these witnesses acknowledge that there must have been something that triggered it. And um, there seems to have been quite a violent, conflictual relationship between Cover and Peters. We don't know the origins of that. Um, but when we know that two years later, he accuses of her, her of attempting to murder his infant, then it seems to me that you know there are layers of backstory here that um, that we don't understand and um, you know so they blame him for going into a, an unreasonable rage and I think we need to think about what why that might have happened and protecting your wife and a child might be the reason for that Martha I mean I wanted to pick up your last question of the why of the blame mm -hmm. document the brain hiding in plain view for so long mm -hmm. Uh-huh, uh-huh, and it's an English surname. And she was mm -hmm. married with three mm -hmm. boys. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm not quite sure, Martha, I'm trying to sort of recreate, you know, what happened. Um, I just know that either at the moment of seeing it or soon after, 
I figured it out. So I think, I think if we extended the moment for a moment, and so those, those big folio volumes only have mm, the minutes, right? They only said the governor and council that day began to hear this case, and then it was delayed, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't at that moment, I perhaps didn't know. But once you look up the file papers in the Suffolk file collection that, do you see what I mean? So I guess I was going back and forth for these contested will cases between the minute book and the Suffolk files. And once I found the Suffolk files, particularly Snow Francis's deposition, you know, tells us who John Peters was, and we'd never known, right? We'd never known that he grew up in Middleton, that he was enslaved in Essex County, that his brothers were named Fran do you see what I mean? So I think it's really once I saw the file papers, and, you know, then I was able to say. And it's partly because, you know, teaching Phyllis Wheatley's, uh, it was on my mind, and I'm always looking for African Americans in these records, so I kind of keep a yeah. running list. And so again, I think you're doing this well, <laughs> it's hard. To, it's hard to know, <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes. Right. Right. No. Absolutely. Um, there was a story there. <laughs> Yes, yes. And the only thing I would say, you know, on, on both of those cases, of course, once um, I was tracking this down, I read through all the indexes of the Essex County court records, and there are other John Peters, you know, who are white John Peters who live in Essex County, in Epswich and uh, Beverly, I think. You know, so you had to then say, oops, no, that's not going to tell me <laughs> about the John Peters I want to know about. And so there are Peterses in Essex County. Um, so John and then... Yeah. Um, I, here's what I can. Yeah. Here's what I can tell you. Um, I think we can be pretty sure we know where the Wilkins homestead was. The house is no longer there, but but one Wilk there there were a lot of Wilkinses in town, um, going back generations, and one from that vintage is still there. And um, my article contains a map. It's, it's not particularly good in the printed version, but in the dig you know, digital version, you can blow it up from the wonderful set of town maps that Martha told me about a long time ago, 1794 or so. Um, the state can asked every town to have a map drawn. And so um, on that map, we can really show where, where it was, partly because there were some distinctive um, geographical landmarks. So the, the probably 200 acre farm was above Wilkins Pond, which is a reservoir now. Um, and um, Lake Street, I think it's called, runs right along uh, above the pond and goes right into the tiny little center of Middleton that we were, that you and I were talking about. So we, and, and also, here's another geographical landmark. This, this, the farm was on the foothill of what's called Wills Hill, which is a reference to um, an, a Native American chief who um, lived on that hill when um, Bray Wilkins and others settled the town. Um, and so it's still called Wills Hill on the maps and the maps from the 18th century. So we do know where it was, but we don't um, and there's actually a hand-drawn, a hand-painted um, sort of folk-style painting of a Wilkins homestead in the Flint Library. At so that's another kind of document we could use to imagine the house or something. John, do yeah. You, do you know what other African Americans who were actually enslaved in Essex County, New York? Or, or Suffolk County, New York? Yeah. I mean, it's right. It's not necessarily. Mm -mm. Hmm. Right. Well, and physician, physician too. I mean, in, in, in all his, um, I was just looking at the probate file again this morning. Um, <coughs> you know, the white people who appraise the inventory and create the inventory and settle the estate call him physician. Um, 
So, uh, no, this is a question, John, is does that mean he's giving legal advice? He's not admitted to the bar. Um, <coughs> and, well, and the attempting to get, I mean, yeah. the first thing is like about mm -hmm. smell or something, and mm -hmm. he didn't say anything about the other two drugs. Mm -hmm. it's, it's tempting to say that it was maybe simply given to the wrong person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, the real sign of this is that in 1793, he is indicted for barratry, which would be vex vexatious litigation. Um, and that almost never happened. It's one of those things on the books that the prosecutors never bother to, or r r rarely, right? And so to me, that is a sign that the white power structure is trying to repress whatever legal activity he, and. Um, another reason I think it's completely unfair is he, he doesn't, as far as I know, so far I need to keep looking, but he doesn't litigate any more than other <laughs> active <laughs> litigators. <laughs> I mean, we know these New Englanders, right? And so it seems, and, and the suits I've seen him bring are, he had real economic relationships, you know, <laughs> debts and <laughs> credits. And so w the justification for that seems uh, far-fetched to me. But, um, I have been searching recently, and I have found no other suit that he initiates after 1793 in either Suffolk County or Middlesex County. So I think they succeed in making him stop, which is really a tragedy because it's one of your rights is to protect your economic interests, right? So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Rancher Smith, right. Who taken to the extent all the time, all the time, to become trafficked with people, to build boats for them, mm -hmm. and to buy mail to deliver the books mm -hmm. that he had turned up and brought, mm -hmm. eventually took him to court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both of whom, ironically, were veterans of the Continental Army. And uh, they had slightly deserved a lot of money. And, but he gave them a good Well, he was fight. a very strong, he tall gave them a good fight. man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he was a substantial landowner, so it's a really interesting parallel. But with about 100 acres. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Teaching. Right. They were all contributors. Yeah. But I'm glad you bring up Venture Smith because I think there are a number of parallels that are important. And I would just say, again, it just points to 
um, and on, there's ongoing research in, in, on these lines, but we really need to know, in a way, more about African American men and women who were frequent litigators. Um, I haven't published on him, but I've uh, researched a great deal about Scipio Kernum of Newburyport, uh, who was very frequently in court. Um, and uh, he was a truckman, and he was a carter. He was, wasn't a sort of prominent um, landowner. But uh, sometimes when lay people talk with me about my article, they're amazed at um, J John Peters' ability to get lawyers, um, because I haven't talked about this today, but he had very prominent lawyers um, as his counsel in all of these cases. Now, I would just say, as someone who spends a lot of time with 18th century court records, that's not so hard. I mean, you evidently you went to court and you, and you picked up, you know, in Connecticut, you always have a pair of lawyers. Um, you know, rep representing you. So I don't think it was so difficult, but it does show um, his networks, his um, ability. Uh <coughs> we know he himself knows a great deal about, has taught himself about the law. Um, and for people interested in lawyers, um, it's a kind of law, you know, his opponents in Middleton have Theophilus Parsons, who's later the Supreme Court Justice, and, and William Wetmore, he has Theophilus Bradley and I forget the others. His bondsmen really need to be studied because they, they all, Rufus King, I mean, they become really prominent uh, states people. So, so the networks are a fascinating issue. And if someone has said to me, if you're a, we also have a physical description of, it turns out, of, of, ta of John Peters as a tall, well-limbed, lusty, likely fellow, meaning a good-looking uh, person. Um, could you just walk into a lawyer's office in Salem and as an a, as a black man and I mean I actually assume you could I there's it's not you know we're not in Jim Crow territory yet we have a lot did of prejudice yes yes he, yes, he did he yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um, but there's a whole story there I think about the networks um, and one of his lawyers James Sullivan um, clearly there was a connection with his wife because Phyllis Wheatley had written a poem. Um, and offered it to James Sullivan and his wife eight years earlier when one of their infants died. So you need to also ask, yes, exactly, uh, ask what, what influence did she have in brokering some of his um, relationships? Yes, Mark. Is there any law position in Middleton to the person no, it's fascinating. I mean, I don't know yet, right? I mean, I've I visited once, but if people have ideas <laughs> um, about Martha and I are thinking of visiting again, and you're invited, Don. <laughs> right. Um, what do you think? I mean, I well, early is there a history of Middleton? I don't know. Yes, uh, Laura Watkins. Oh, yeah. Laura yeah, Woodside Park is right there. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Um, or, or perhaps the way. No, no, she, and she has a chapter. You're, I mean, it's a more modern, it's not an antiquarian 19th century town history, right? But she has her chapter on slavery in Middleton. And she does due diligence. But of course, everyone missed. I thought you were going to ask the question, why did we miss these records for <laughs> hundreds of years? And one, one, one answer is, just to put it briefly, that um, Phyllis Wheatley is never mentioned. In the, in the dossier. So you have to know that John Peters is her husband. Uh, his wife is mentioned twice in the depositions. And so once we know, but, but of course, if you just looked at them, you wouldn't know that this is Phyllis Wheatley, the poet. Um, so this is, a, this is an issue, I think, Don, in that if we read the seven or so um, mentions of Phyllis Wheatley in the Essex County papers before the couple arrived in Middleton, she would be the celebrated, the genius, the, um, the things that white people sometimes patronizingly said about Phyllis Wheatley and her poetry and her output. Um, but it's like a minor celebrity arriving in town um, and in a town that mm, I, you know, doesn't have a lot of highly lettered people. So I actually think there were perhaps tensions and discomfort 
um, about, um, I mean, and they arrive with their mahogany tables and these amazing books that she brought from England. Uh, and I think that m perhaps made people uncomfortable, not just the race, racial identity of these newcomers, but some class and refinement tensions too. Well, we, we don't do this by town, right? I mean, but, but I mean, you know, I, my sense in New England in general is that uh, reading, reading is very high, uh, writing maybe 70 or 80 percent. Um, um, but I'm going to deflect a little bit here. Um, but there aren't a lot of, you know, this is an index that we use sometimes of Harvard graduates. And in Middleton, it's quite different from Andover. Um, one thing that I think there's um, some study is comparing John Peters' literacy to Phyllis Wheatley Peters' literacy. So she has beautiful 18th century handwriting. We have letters that survive on the MHS website and Library Company of Philadelphia, et cetera. Um, his literacy is interesting. He clearly reads and writes, but we only so far know of his hand, his signature on documents. I have yet to find a document that's written in his hand. Um, and this makes sense because he must have taught himself um, or, or sought out um, um, education, but, it, but in a kind of patchwork way, um, whereas um, she learned alongside the daughters of John and Susanna Wheatley and was um, encouraged to learn Latin and read Alexander Pope, et cetera. So, so I think it's an interesting contrast, something to think more about, maybe. Different uh, sorts of literacy. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, when you were talking with Lynn Brown, books were on the street. Right. <laughs> It's complicated. Um, I think by early 1780, he has settled on that. But there's an overlap, because in the will of Lieutenant Wilkins, he is named Peter Freisler. Um, and that was written in November of 78. And then in the first probate appeal, the, court ha the cl clerk has to sort of write, you know, Peter Freisler, alias John Peter. So I mean, at one point, I speculated. When he goes to Middleton to visit the <coughs> Wilkinses, he calls himself Peter Freiser. I don't know why. But in Boston, he's John Peters. Is there some strategy there um, that I haven't figured out? But in that period of time, did, mm -hmm. did John Francis Price Peter have any awareness when he worked at Wheatley for Grant Carver and Milton Goldman? Uh -huh. Nova Scotia, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Or any awareness from during black war in the streets of Boston or where he went to the establishment of Sierra Leone. Right. Well, I mean um so there's common yeah. historical common yeah. procedure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had a, mm -hmm. a, a colleague in literature uh -huh. in the Department of Art and Art Studies at North Boston, University of North, North Boston, mm -hmm. who was Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. whose name was Jonathan Peter. Oh, really? Uh, oh, interesting. And my, my stereotype is that Sierra mm. Gold was mm -hmm. that Fort Wheatley considered to be the prison of the first name. <laughs> Well, I can't answer that question, except that someone, uh, I'm forgetting who, corresponded with Phyllis Wheatley before she was married and tried to interest her in becoming a missionary to Sierra Leone or to West Africa, and she politely <laughs> turned them down. Right? Yeah, that's so. Maybe. I, ca I, was tr I was trying to remember who, who wrote the letter to her. Um, so I see that connection. I suspect the Peters there comes from, you know, another source. Um, 
because we also, well, first of all, we now know who his brothers are, and they don't use that surname, and we don't know the parents. Um, and he and, of course, Phyllis had no surviving children, sad to say, so, so the name did not live on from them. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you.